Up to now, I've only described a simple finite state machine and provided an example implementation. The goal was to calculate if a string of ones and zeros contained an even or odd number of ones. While this isn't very exciting, it fits the basic definition of a machine. Suppose you configured a set of mechanical gears, water pipes, or electronic components in such a way that when fed a string of ones and zeros, it behaves like our paper machine from the last video. Then you would have built yourself a real life computer. The only advantage electronics provides us is a way to build computation machines in an incredibly efficient and compact manner. What's even more fascinating about our circle and line drawing is that it is no more or less powerful than any modern day processor or computer program, provided they do not use or touch memory. Sure, Intel i3s are much faster than me with a pen, but without memory they cannot solve any more or fewer problems than my drawings can. All we needed to do was set up the configuration of the machine in a particular way, feed it some input in the form of a string, and let it arrive in an end state. That was the calculation and the answer to the question we were asking, how many ones or zeros in this string? Bioshock water pipe hacking doesn't seem quite as dumb when we rephrase the concept of what an actual machine or computer is. The next question to ask is, does adding memory, also known as storage, to our drawing, allow us to solve any more problems than a finite state machine can solve? The answer is yes. The memory we're going to be using is that of a stack, a last in, first out data structure. So let's redraw our machine to include the storage interface. Carrying on from the last video, I'm going to redraw our finite state machine that told us whether or not a string of ones and zeros contained an even number of ones or an odd number of ones. Now remember, we had two states. We had an even state, which we also designated the start state. This is where we start searching from and we had an odd state. Then we had four transitions. If we were even and saw a one, we'd transfer ourselves into the odd state. Remember to label this with a one. If we were in the odd state and we saw another one, we'd transfer ourselves into the even state. And if we saw a zero, it didn't have any effect on our result at all, so we just remained in the current state, whichever side we were in. Now I stated this to you, but I didn't prove it. I said that this finite state machine, as long as we followed each arrow around this area, it would always tell us whether or not a string of ones or zeros of any finite length had an even number of ones or an even number of zeros. Now the question stated before was, can we make this any more powerful by adding memory? And the memory we used was a stack. So if you just imagine this here, this pit here, which is our finite state machine, has no memory, and it is essentially just some process that carries on once we start at the beginning. We start at the beginning, we're fed some input, and it will just run until it ends up to some point. This is very similar to a computer program that has instructions. You have some instructions or assembly, such as move, add, sub, that you will start at the beginning of this program and just go to each instruction until you either crash, run out of instructions, or you hit some sort of end state. Now with operating systems this end state is to normally sit in a loop waiting for more programs to operate. Now this is what a finite state machine is. In here we haven't drawn any memory, but what we're going to do now is add the idea of a stack. So out to the left I'm going to draw a very basic representation of a stack. Now remember the stack is important at the top and the bottom. And we have slots. We have slots in the stack. Storage areas, little locations, little lockers, whatever you want to call them. And these lockers contain data. But the rule with a stack is we can only either push or add data to the top of the stack with a push instruction most typically or we can remove or pop information from the stack with the pop instruction. We can create, using this finite state machine and some logic for interacting with the stack, an interface that's able to store memory back and forth between the finite state machine 
and RAM, or physical storage, or whatever we'd like to call it. It turns out that this machine, with this small addition, is much more powerful than one without a stack. The general name for these types of computers is pushdown automata. A typical example you may have heard of is a regular expression. Regular expressions are useful most often through utilities such as grep, but when you're using them they don't quite feel as dynamic as a fully blown programming language such as Python, and that's because they're not. A very famous problem strict regular expressions and thus finite state machines cannot solve is the recognition of palindromes. For those of you that are unaware, a palindrome is a word that is the same forwards as it is backwards. Race car is a really good example. If we read it forwards, it says race car, and if we read it backwards, it also says race car. Try as hard as you may with strict regular expression languages and finite state machines, they can never identify palindromes. This idea raises another question. Does adding another stack to make two stacks allow us to solve any more problems beyond that of a finite state machine and regular expression? As you can probably guess from the existence of palindrome checkers on the internet, the answer is yes. A finite state machine with two stacks is more powerful than one with a single stack, and the name for these computers is Turing machines, named after the famous British mathematician. As you can probably guess, they are the basis of all modern day computers, programming languages and palindrome recognition engines. My drawing with two stacks is as powerful as every single computer that even has, will or can exist, including quantum computers. The only difference is how much space I take up and how quickly I can work through my problems with a pen and paper. There are no more or fewer problems that can be solved by an IBM supercomputer versus your calculator, it's just that the IBM gets there much quicker. This again raises another question. Does adding another stack, three this time, allow us to solve problems beyond that of Turing machines? And the answer is a categorical no. There is nothing that it can exist in our current understanding of the universe that can solve more problems than I can without my drawing and a couple of stacks. Next, I'm going to apply these high-level concepts to programming assembly itself.